the door, so. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for those who are with us in person uh, and those who are watching us online. We're extremely delighted to be here in Amman and this, and after so hard work to get together all these people, it's really nice to see faces uh, in front of us. Uh, so this is a very interesting panel and actually this is one of our first times to address issues of displacement as an environmental politics program. And if we look in a general setting of increased environmental change, individuals and communities in the developing world tend to incorporate environmental risk into their livelihoods, meaning that their social position, political relationships, and economic assets are affected by the incoming changes. So the most common response to chronic environmental degradation by individuals and communities is to intensify labor migration patterns. So in the case of a sudden or prolonged disasters, as we have seen in other parts, whether it's a famine or a drought, and even in other contexts and conflict areas, patterns of distress, migration, are characterized by short-term relocations to nearby areas as observed. So are these Middle East, is this applicable to the Middle East and North African countries? And are we seeing these kinds of, or this is an exception of the rule? So there's a 2014 World Bank report. It showed that more than three fourths of surveyed household in the MENA region in different countries and whether urban or uh, rural areas acknowledge that deteriorating climate conditions in the recent years are affecting their livelihoods. And at the same time, households in rural areas recognize being affected by weather shocks, um, especially relating to their agricultural income and livestock lo losses and mostly affected household direct declared being unable to recover from the shock. So if we look at uh, when people are faced with severe environmental degradation and conflict, what do they do? They have three options. One, they stay and adapt and mitigate to the effects of climate change. Two, they stay, do nothing, and accept a lower quality of life. And three, they leave the affected areas and move somewhere else. So within this today's panel discussion, and it will be two rounds, huh? we will have a first round, uh, mostly looking at, and again, uh, how do you think, and, and this is a question addressed to our four panelists and five panelists actually here, um, how can we challenge Western literature or displacement? And what does it mean when there is an increase in restrictions in our civic spaces and the liberties in our spaces. So this panel can take a more general look and how this securitization, we tend to look at securitization discourses and more specifically, we look a lot of Western discourses around displacement. So I'll pass the mic with Mike, start first by you, Mike, and uh, you can give us a more, you know, recentralizing the questions of what does recent securitization mean and how can we move away from this towards more governance and understanding why the displaced communities have been affected and who's responsible? Oh, oh, should I use that one? Yeah. Hello. Hi there. I'm Max Skelton. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Regional and International Studies at the American University of Iraq. Um, I'm an anthropologist, and so I come into thinking about questions. I'm a medical anthropologist, so I actually, my background is coming into thinking uh, about questions of the environment in relation to disease uh, and uh, the impact of climate change and environmental degradation and war on um, you know, fragile ecosystems and how that impacts health. Uh, but that's not really the, the focus of my discussion today. Um, when we think about displacement and we think about the kinds of ways that displacement is framed in the region, the terms that we use, you know, you often run into these kinds of, um, you know, uh, common terminologies, climate security, climate peace and security. Um, and these terminologies have real power uh, and they bring together specific networks and specific forms of data collection that have their limits. For all of the debates around 
you know, is securitization a problem? Is it not a problem? I know that from working in Iraq for many years as a researcher, that oftentimes when you, when I get an invite to a climate security roundtable or something, who's, who's at the table? It's some guy from the National Security Advisory, a couple of generals, um, some sort of uh, EU advisors who have some kind of political military uh, portfolio, um, and maybe a couple of, of climate experts who have sort of been duped into coming there and didn't really understand what the whole thing was about to begin with. The data that gets shared at these kinds of roundtables is typically a mishmash of climatological projections and displacement figures. So, you know, uh, in Iraq, uh, we have lower precipitation. Uh, this was our levels of precipitation for the last three years. Here's how it will be in 2040. Uh, on top of that, we have higher temperatures, so the evapotranspiration tr rate <clears throat> is going up. Climate change is a problem. Then there'll be some data that will say, well, you know, 20,000 people across 10 provinces uh, were displaced because of, of water scarcity last year. Uh, we have a climate problem. We have a displacement problem. Voila, we have climate security problem, right? The, the kinds of sort of you know, and then the, the the policy solutions that get discussed around the table usually have to do with kind of better monitoring, better surveillance, you know, tracking uh, conflict climate dynamics. Because one of the, the big sorts of assumptions here is that when people are displaced, they move around and they become very dangerous when they move around. Uh, so they move into urban areas, people get mad, uh, there's fights over resources, and these fights over resources lead to intercommunal violence, or the, the conflict is framed more locally. You know, uh, you have farmers that are um, don't have access to to their livelihoods, and so they're fighting with with each other. This whole discursive space, at least in the in the context of Iraq that I'm familiar with, creates you know a kind of of, of discourse that's totally depoliticized that has no real data, has no real sense of history, and that is mostly just nonsense. I mean, it really is nonsense. So how can we create different kinds of spaces as researchers and as think tanks uh, that get us beyond these kinds of frameworks? And I, by the way, I understand there are people in this sort of climate security field uh, academically who look at these things differently and they have sort of you know, a more human understanding of, of security that's more about lived reality and all that kind of stuff. I just think that it's it's sometimes when you when you actually get into these environments, these policy spaces, as soon as you were, use the word climate security, it brings together a very specific network, okay? So how can we create new networks and new forms of data? I, I, I'll get into, I think I'll, I'm getting close to the end of my time, uh, but just a couple quick points. One, I think that think tanks, um, I'm not saying that think tanks in the region that were hugely powerful actors, but we tend to have a little bit more institutional protection than, say, some uh, brave epidemiologist in Basra uh, who, you know, wants to uh, share some very um, uh, troubling data uh, and is afraid of being targeted. Uh, think tanks in the region, we, didn't, we tend to have a little bit of, of institutional backing, international support. Uh, and so we can share data that is often a little bit, um, you know, punchier than than individual researchers who don't have that kind of of support. And so, data that that creates linkages between environmental degradation, health impacts, uh, the kinds of data that was, uh, you know, uh, in the first panel around extractive in, uh, industries, all of these things are are causal mechanisms of displacement. Uh, in, in ways that are much more primary than, uh, than you know, precipitation levels, uh, if, if I'm totally honest. Uh, the second thing is that we can, we can sort of unfurl governance in a layered and complicated way. One of the th things that we found when we talked to the donor community, talked to diplomats and, uh, you know, people at the UN, they typically, you know, have no idea that Iraq is a complicated country with very different and complex forms of governance when it comes to water and environment. You have a Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Water, Ministry of Health, uh, and all of these ministries 
countries have different jurisdictional domains, different politics, different budgets. Uh, sometimes they can enact what they want to do, sometimes they can't. Climate security is a way of sort of sidestepping the complexity of these governance regimes. And think tanks and researchers in the region can, can do a lot to say, well, actually, let's try and understand the particulars of how this governance system works. What are the different incentive structures that might drive one ministry or another ministry? Uh, and how can advocacy be rerouted so that it actually interacts with the governance system as it is, rather than some sort of generic idea of the Iraqi government or the Jordanian government or whatever? Uh, I'll stop there. Um, but I'm, I, the, the, the final, very final point I'll make is that I do think uh, there's, there are ways think tanks can open up space for data and advocacy to come together. Uh, one of these projects that we're doing at my institute with PACS is looking at citizen science and how um, you know, uh, local communities can produce environmental data that then feed into policy conversations uh, and environmental data that's not just easy stuff, that's actually quite controversial and um, you know, sheds light on, on some of these uh, environmental injustices. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. Um, we'll go to uh, Mustaid and also around the area that Mac uh, talked about, um, data, having data, and how can think tanks also provide you know, uh, critical knowledge vis-a-vis moving away as well from securitization, but what, in your own experience in Yemen, how can you use your own data and how, what data are you using yourself vis-a-vis well, -vis internal and displacement uh, examples? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, maybe I'll start to elaborate more on the Mac response. So I would say framing the displacement as a security issue or threat actually is the threat itself which can lead to more threats, whether among displaced people themselves or among displaced people and host communities or host uh, uh, countries. And this can lead to more uh, policies and practice uh, on uh, controlling borders uh, rather than uh, protecting uh, displaced people. So uh, this discourse uh, uh, also can lead to more uh, discrimination against uh, displaced people. Uh, and uh, make it difficult for them to uh, uh, access to the basic services. And uh, to challenge this discourse, I think it's important to move forward um, uh, to a more human uh, approach. Uh, and uh, uh, at the same time, to address the root causes of, of displacement and how to mitigate uh, the displacement, or at least to establish a stability in displaced uh, places. And I think in this in this case, I think tank can play a big role in, um, in uh, providing a space for a multidisciplinary approach uh, from, uh, for experts from different sectors, economic, social, uh, uh, but also from social communities itself and uh, affected people themselves to, st to, to study the experience and knowledge and how to uh, uh, move forward and uh, uh, also to support the uh, uh, governance of uh, displacement. So sharing knowledge uh, is, is, is very important and I think uh, think tanks can play uh, big roles, especially in uh, developing countries where the data is lacking uh, and think tank uh, I think this is also the case in all Arab countries. Uh, the data is uh, very problematic and think tank can play a big role in this in this space. So moving to the uh, many case and the uh, internal and external displacement, in Yemen we have more than 4 million internal displaced people. Uh, and this is a very big number compared to the overall population in Yemen. And uh, this is, uh, not only as a result of the conflict and uh, destruction of infrastructures and uh, spread of uh, uh, of the problems uh, because of the conflict, but also before, because of the climate uh, extreme events. There are around 10% of these displaced people is because of the climate events. And in many cases, the displaced people are forced 
to displace more than one or two times, whether because of the conflict or disputes between the displaced people and host communities, or because, because of the uh, climate uh, events like floods and uh, cyclones. Because normally the people, the displaced people took places in the public areas, which is normally close to the uh, flood areas. And when there is uh, high floods, uh, the people start to think again about new, uh, new areas. Uh, so I did, so internally displaced people face uh, very big challenges in Yemen. And um, yeah, the responses, I think this we will speak in the second point. But when we come to the extern external displaced displacement, we have also a huge number of displaced people to the outside Yemen. Uh, and, and we have two types of uh, external displaced people. Uh, the first type is the people with limited abilities to, to, to travel outside Yemen and who actually uh, expose themselves to the risk of the travel, whether through the sea or through the deserts or through the borders. And many people lost their lives during this uh, risky uh, travels to looking for a better life in, in, in other countries. Um, and the other type are the qualified uh, and uh, uh, educated people who have a better chance to find studies or work outside Yemen. But also we have other type who, are, who has enough abilities, uh, economic abilities, financial abilities, whether the business, businessman or also the uh, political people. They have uh, good abilities to establish their new life in other countries. And for them, it is easier to establish their lives whether in other countries or, 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 or also as refugees. They have a better chance to, to apply as, as refugees outside Yemen. And and the, and the, the 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 problem for Yemen here is is more related to the qualified and educated people because it's a, a brain drain for Yemenis uh, and uh, especially the public institutions in Yemen. Um, and uh, actually, we, we at Sanaa Center uh, because I'm I'm working as a water environment and climate change specialist in Sanaa Center for strategic studies. We have established a number of studies related to the impact of uh, internal displacement in Yemen, but also about uh, the refugees outside Yemen and uh, in other countries. Uh, for those who are interested, maybe you can share this afterwards. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Musaad. Uh, I'd like to go to Abdel Fattah. I mean, if you look at Sudan today, it's more than 8 million displaced. And, it, and the Sudan crisis is not really visible. Um, how can you, what are the implications and how the internal dynamics have changed due to the conflict and how citizens are actually accessing uh, water, food and other infrastructures, specifically in the displaced areas? So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Sari. Thank you, Arab Reform Legislative uh, and uh, Robert Paz for organizing this timely uh, event. So I will switch to, to Arabic. I feel more comfortable speaking in Arabic. Uh, I'm Abdel Fattah from the Middle East Council, uh, based in Doha. I'm working on the issues of the and foreign policy, and the energy transition, and climate change. Okay. As I mentioned, the issue in Sudan is a very difficult issue. أكبر أزمة تقريبا الآن موجودة في الشرق الأوسط في السودان أكثر مما يقارب 8 مليون نازح في داخل السودان وما يقارب ال 2 مليون تقريبا رفيجيز في النيبرز كنتريز إضافة إلى هنالك ما يقارب ال 13 تقريبا قتيل وعشرات الآلاف منهم جرحى ومفقودين حتى الآن مش معروف الحظ شنو. الوضع كارثي أكثر طبعا الأزمة زي ما عارفين بدأت تقريبا مما يقارب ال 11 شهرا وكان في كونفليكت ما بين ال ربي سبورتد فورس والجيش النظامي. اتطور الأم وتفاقم أصبح وأثر تماما على الإيكونوميك أثر على الكروشر الإنفراستراكشر ومنها البيئة بلا شك يعني إضافة
حتى الى الكارثه الانسانيه الان اللي بيشهدها تقريبا اكثر من نصف سكان السودان في حاجه الى مساعدات نسبه لتوقف الخدمات تماما نسبه لتوقف السيلاريز وغيرها من الـ من الايكونوميك اكتيفيتيز اضافه الى ذلك هنالك 18 تقريبا مليون في حاجه ماسه الى المساعده يعني يكاد يكون على شفه مجاعه 18 مليون في كنتري اوريدي معرض لكوارث طبيعيه معرض لخطر تغيرات مناخيه وغيرها من الـ من الـ من الايكونوميك كرايزيز وغيرها من الـ من الـ من الكوارث اللي صبت على السودان فالوضع عموما كارثه تماما طبعا اضافه الى تفشي كثير جدا من الامراض الديسيسز مثل الكوليرا وغيرها من الديسيسز كوليرا مثلا في في معسكرات النزوح سجلت اكثر من 10 عشر 10000 عشر تقريبا حاله ما بين النازحين وده طبعا راجع بصوره رئيسيه لانه الانفايرومنتال ديرين تيكن كونسيدريشن ديورينج الهيومانيتيريان انترفينشن آه يعني بتكلم عن الناس العاملين في الحقل آه الماجورتي الان جي اوز مركزين اكثر على الهيومانيتيريان اسيستنت بينما الانفايرومنتال اللي هو البيزك مثلا الهايجين والسانيتيشن اتس نوت كفرنج في الـ في الانترنال ديسليس كامب او الامرجنسي شالتر وغيره من الـ من الـ حتى الهوست كوميونيتيز كذلك في الأزمة كومبليكيتد أكثر وأكثر وطبعا إضافة إلى عندنا هناك مشكلة إنترنت بلاك أوت و تيليكومينيكيشن بلاك أوت وانهيار للنظام المصرفي سببت الأزمة كلها في إن زيادة لمعاناة المواطنين وطبعا إضافة إلى الرجوع لسؤال سارين هل النازحين الآن ال 8 مليون نتيجة العنف يعني هم نقدر نربط العنف الان الحاصل الان ما بين البارامتري فورس والجيش بنسبة لتغيرات مناخيه وكذا لكن العنف الان يسبب في صراع عنيف والصراع العنيف فاق من الازمات البيئيه والازمات الانسانيه والازمات الاقتصاديه ففيما قبل الصراع هنالك في السودان ما يقارب ال 3 مليون ونص نازح في داخل السودان مين اللي بسبب الكوارث زي الفلودينج في 2000 مثلا 21 2022 الفلودينج سبب في تدمير ما يقارب الالاف المنازل هجرت الاف الاسر كاملا لمعسكرات اضافه الى تسبيبه في قتل مئات و وغيرها من من المشاكل إضافة إلى إلى ذلك الكونفليكت والنازحين النزحوا بسبب الصراعات العنيفة، طبعا هنا مش مش ما بالضرورة الصراع العنيف يعني يكون ناجي نسبة لاختلافات إثنية أو طبقية أو اقتصادية، المين كوز لو رجعنا في في الأول بنلقى إنه ناجم عن الكومبيتيشن على الأجريكلتشر لاند على الووتر لاند على الفود وغيرها من من المصادر الرئيسيه اللي هي ناجمه عن التغيرات المناخيه عندنا تقريبا في في بدايه 2000 و 2010 وانت ما مين للكنتري بعد انفصال جنوب السودان كان بيعتمد على البترول في في الريفينيو انفصال جنوب السودان يسبب في 75% من الموارد النفط في بلاد جنوب السودان اصبح ال 65% من الجي دي بي معتمد على الاجريكلشن فالديتيريوريشن اللي حصل في الانفايرومنت كان سبب رئيسي في انه يسبب في ديسربشن للايفليهود لملايين نزحوا من الرورال اريا للاربان اريا وبالتالي سبب في تكدس آه الاسر وسبب في آه في تكدس البابيوليشن في مناطق نوت ويل ستراكشر تو انها تتحمل آه ملايين الناس وبالتالي بنلقى في شنو بنلقى في حاصل ديتيريوريشن في جانب الهيلث ديتيريوريشن في جانب الايديوكيشن وغيرها من القطاعات 
فالوضع فال... ال... كارثي وكمان في معسكرة النزوح عندنا كومبيتيشن على ال... على الووتر واللاند وال ال... الكامب ذاته ممكن تكون مقامه في اراضي الاراضي هذه ممكن تكون تاريخيا تعود الى بعض الناس وهكذا الكونفليكت ويحصل تنشن ما بين الكوميونتي جروبس طيب هذه هذا هذه التوترات وهذا النزوح بلا شك سيفاق من الازمه حتى في المستقبل يعني اوكي الان الحرب ممكن تنتهي اذا الان ما في افق حتى الان تنتهي ممكن تنتهي لكن عواقبها حتستمر معنا عشرات السنين اكثر واكثر ليش لانه عندنا كميه من النازحين اوريدي موجودين في مناطق نزوح مناطق النزوح الموجودين فيها اوريدي في كوميونيتيز ثانيه عندهم معها كونفليكت تاريخي فاي تنشن اي كومبيتيشن على اللاند او على البيزك نيدز الفود ولا غيره ممكن يحصل تنشن وممكن يحصل اكزازربيت للتنشن هيستوري طيب لذلك انا اجد هنا ان المنظمات العامله الان في الهيومانيتيريان والبروفيشن اسيستنت ان اوكي تمام مع انه في في لاك في في البروفيشن بالنسبه للبيزك نيد الا انه القطاع الجانب بتاع الانفايرمنت والجانب بتاع الويست مانجمنت الجانب بتاع الريسورس مانجمنت قائب تماما في في الانترفنشن وبالتالي هنا يمكن ان نتنبا انه الوضع ممكن يصبح كارثي اكثر ممكن يسبب في كثير من المشاكل في المستقبل يسبب في ندره للموارد الاوريدي حاصل ندره فيها والسودان زي ما عارفين اوريدي ومن الدول العشره الاخيره الفونبل للكلايمت تشينج نسبه لانه الووتر ارتفاع الحراره ديت الحراره في السودان اوريدي في بعض المناطق واصل ل 40 تقريبا والدروت اوريدي مهدد ما يقارب ال 18 مليون هكتار من الارب لاند اضافه الى الديسيفيرتيكيشن اللي هي 65% تقريبا من اراضي السودان ممكن تهدد بزحف الصحراء وغيرها من المشاكل الناجمه عن التغيرات المناخيه وبالتالي الدوله في ظل الوضع الحاصل وفي ظل الويك جفرنس يمكن ان نشهد الوضع يزداد خطوره ان لم تتدخل الانترناشونال كوميونتي والان جي اوز والستيك هولدر في السودان وفي في المنطقه لحد هنا تقريبا اكون ان شاء الله ملتزم بزمني نرجع رح نرجع لعنده اوكي يمكن بدي انتقل ل اي اد لايك تو موف تو جورجي ام ويزن يور اون اكسبرتيز اند ريبريزنتينغ ذا هيومانيتيريان اورجانيزيشنز اون ذس بانل What are what is what are the roles of the humanitarian institutions in providing the spaces specifically and also providing knowledge vis-a-vis -vis the local communities? And if we're looking today, whether it was UN as mentioned in the previous panel, um, and what are the current also political pressures that you are going through as an institution, specifically UNRWA, because she's representing UNRWA today. Um, Uh, given the many pressures that you are, how are you able also to navigate within within this space? And maybe here reflect as well towards um, the main title of this, the, the nexus between conflict and climate and how uh, in induced displacement and the role of humanitarian interventions. In five minutes. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Serene. And as Serene mentioned, I'm the uh, Environmental sustainab Sustainability Manager for UNRWA. Uh, the agency representing uh, supporting Palestine refugees. Uh, part of UNRWA's mandate um, is is to support uh, people displaced from Palestine right across the region, so in Gaza and the West Bank, uh, but also in countries like Jordan, uh, Syria and Lebanon, where we are looking at one of the most protracted situations of displacement in, uh, in the world today. Um, There have been some really uh, rich comments already brought up by the panel, and I, I hope in talking a little bit about the international uh, perspective, uh, we can we can address some of those because I think Mac is exactly right. We really do need to do more to be promoting cross-functional work and and getting out of silos. And I I confess my first thought was. The UN is made up of 50 something separate agencies. How are we well placed to do that? But in fact, we must. Um, I think one of the the great 
enabling mechanisms, if we just go really, really high level for a moment, has been the sustainable development goals and the recognition that, first of all, the Millennium Development Goals were missing the environmental perspective and that without an environmental sustainability dimension, you don't have sustainable development at all. Uh, the, the second element is that I think we have seen in relation to the Gaza crisis and in relation to a number of displacement uh, crises, we've seen very strong leadership from uh, both the Secretary General but also the heads of affected agencies in emphasising to those far outside this region the humanity of the people who have been accepted by it. And, and I think that global perspective, that global picture continues to be uh, extremely important. Uh, there was a a mission that I led re, uh, some time ago in, or contributed to some time ago in WFP in Kenya, where we brought Australian politicians out who thought they knew refugees, understood refugees. They had former refugees living in their electorates. And when we took them to Kakuma in the north of Kenya and they could see how people were living and try to imagine how much worse conditions must be for people to have left there to come here. And it was a real... It was a real eye-opener um, in terms of, of expanding people's perspective. And, and the United Nations, the international humanitarian community, does have a very important role to play in, in providing that window between the world and, and uh, the, the, the wider world and especially the, the nation states that, that fund uh, international support work um, and, and the, the, the situation on the ground. That global view does by necessity, well, not by necessity, has of, I think too often meant that there is a perhaps a, um, there's not been enough differentiation, picking up one of the comments that was made earlier, that, that, that there has been a need, and I think it's, it's increasingly recognised now in the international community, that we do need to be um, improving our understanding of the complexities on the ground and, uh, and engaging uh, in context appropriate uh, solutions, uh, understanding the the many contributing factors, and, um, and and looking for solutions that that work based on um, you know by that as a result as a product of that better engagement with um, with local uh, with local communities. Nowhere is that more important than in the realm of, of climate change and that role is as an interface between the local and the global. Um, because of course, 85% of people who are displaced are in developing countries and developing countries did not cause climate change. But we are um, in countries like Jordan or Kenya or any of the other, Yemen or Syria, um, we are bearing the brunt of, of climate change. And so local host communities who are already water stressed are then shouldering the responsibility of supporting um, uh, people who have, have been displaced. And, and in countries like Jordan um, it, well, the, and, and, and Yemen, and, and uh, the, the burden is, is significant. Lebanon, another 10, 20, 30% of the population uh, people who have come from somewhere else and in many other contexts, of course, we have many people who have been displaced within their own country and, and their countrymen are, um, are supporting them and, and hosting them. Um, there are, I think, a number of promising examples, which we might talk about in round two of our engagement, um, where we are looking at, at uh, you know, where we can, we can talk about the ways where that um, national, regional, and uh, sorry, na global, national, and local engagement is starting to happen and really bring about some some positive results. There is an enormous need to scale that up. Um, but what I will close uh, close with by by saying now is that um, at a time where displaced people have doubled in over a decade, where climate change is reaching a tipping point, uh, this, as we all know, this uh, this means that. Uh, the crisis uh, crisis situations are and co conflict is is increasing so the it, it really feels as though a, a number of really significant factors are are converging and so it is on all of us as international practitioners humanitarians development specialists 
um, medical anthropologist, uh, whatever our specialism and, and whatever our skills, to really double down on our efforts to engage with each other um, to continue both our advocacy and our efforts on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Maybe we'll jump back to uh, Zena and as a journalist and uh, how can you, in the context of Syria, how can you amplify the voices of those who have been displaced specifically even before 2011 and up to, to date? مرحبا انا رح احكي بالعربي كمان ساعة حدا بده يحط ترجمة انا اسمي زينة شهلة انا صحفية من سوريا وحاليا انا بشتغل محررة قسم البيئة مع موقع رصيف 22 مختصة بقضايا البيئة والثقافة كثير في اكيد اشياء لازم نعملها كصحفيين لحتى نحكي عن موضوع النزوح المتعلق بالبيئة والمناخ واللي هو للاسف ما له كثير يعني متناول حاليا بالصحافة العربية سواء صحافة التقليدية أو ما يسمى صحافة البديلة والمستقلة واحدة من أبسط البديهيات أن نحن نسمع أصوات الناس يعني إذا هلأ بنفتح نقرأ كثير تقارير سواء بالإعلام العربي أو الغربي عن موضوع النزوح المتعلق بالبيئة بنلاقي كثير تقارير هي عم تحكي عن الموضوع كثير بشكل عمومي بدون ما عن جد نعرف هدول الناس شو عم بيصير فيهم شو خياراتهم كثير من الأشخاص اللي هن ممكن ينزحوا لأسباب بيئية وطبعا كثير صعب نفرق احيانا تماما السبب البيئي عن النزاع عن اسباب اقتصاديه واجتماعيه كثير متداخله مع بعضه لكن كثير اشخاص لما ينزحوا ما بيكون خيارهم تماما انه هن مثلا ينزحوا على الدول الغربيه هن ممكن يفضلوا ينزحوا على مكان كثير بيشبههم بيقدروا يرجعوا يمارسوا فيه نفس العادات والتقاليد والممارسات تبعهم اشتغلنا مثلا على تقارير عن السوريين اللي نزحوا على لبنان هنا كان كان يعني ظروف اجبرتهم يروحوا لهنيك لكن قدروا انه هن ينقلوا بعض من ممارساتهم لهنيك ويشتغلوا مثلا بموضوع الزراعه فكثير مهم انه نحن نقابل الناس ونفهم شو بدهم هن لوين عن جد ممكن يفضلوا انه يروحوا اذا كان عندهم هذا الخيار طبعا ونحكي على قصص نجاحنا وعن ما لانه في كثير ناس هي عم صحيح عم تنزح وممكن تشكل عبء على المجتمعات المضيفه لكن بنفس الوقت هي قادره انه هي تنقل مجموعه من الخبرات لحتى يعني تستفيد والمجتمع المضيف بنفس الوقت كمان يستفيد. كثير مهم الموضوع المصطلحات لما نحن نحكي بالاعلام المصطلحات المستخدمه للاسف كثير احيانا عم بيوصفوا النازحين او اللاجئين ككتلة بشرية كتير هائلة هي ممكن رايحة تشتاح بعض المجتمعات الثانية حتى تستخدم بعض المصطلحات مثل الفيضان من اللاجئين وعم بحكي هون على الأخص يمكن على الإعلام الغربي فكتير مهم نحن ننتبه على المصطلحات عم بيستخدم اللاجئ دائما أو عم بيوصف اللاجئ دائما كضحية أو كتهديد أمني بينما هو المفروض لا يكون هيك أو هيك فهي واحدة أكيد من الأشياء اللي نحن كصحفيين لازم ننتبه عليها في كثير قضايا العلاقة بالنزوح البيئي أو موضوع النزوح المرتبط بعوامل بيئية ما كثير عم تتغطى بالإعلام خلينا نحكي عن العدالة البيئية ما كثير عم بنحكى على موضوع قديش هذا النزوح كيف عم بيأثر أو العوامل البيئية كيف عم تأثر بشكل غير متوازن على الأشخاص بنفس المجتمعات يعني في أشخاص كثير عم بتحملوا هذا العبء وهن اللي عم بيضطروا ينزحوا بينما في أشخاص ثانيين هن قادرين يتكيفوا مع العوامل البيئية فكثير مهم نحن نغطي ونعرف تماما هدول الأشخاص خاص ليش ان اثرت عليهم هي العوامل البيئيه بشكل اكثر من اشخاص ثانيين وبالتالي نحن كيف قادرين نساعدهم نحن يعني ما زال مثلا خلينا نقول المنظمات الدوليه هي عم بتمول عمليه النزوح او عم قادره انه يعني عم تضطر انه هي تدفع مصاري لحتى تساعد الاشخاص النازحين يمكن الاولى انه يتم توجيهها لدفع مصاري لهدول الاشخاص يتكيفوا مع بيئاتهم ويقدروا يضلوا قاعدين فيها رغم الظروف الصعبه تتمول مثلا البنى التحتيه بهي المجتمعات كيف فهي البنى قادره انه هي تتكيف مع التغيرات المناخيه طبعا هذا الشيء يمكن ببلداننا بالشرق الاوسط مو دائما سهل في عندنا مستويات عاليه من سوء الاداره ومستويات عاليه من الفساد لكن مهم انه يتم فهم هي المجتمعات كيف تغير المناخ عم بيأثر عليها وشو هي الأشياء اللي لازم تتمول لحتى البنى التحتية والناس ضل قادرة تتكيف مع هذا الموضوع، كمان هي واحدة أكيد من أهم أدوار الإعلام، للأسف واحدة من أهم الصعوبات إنه ما عندنا بيانات نحكى كثير عن هذا الموضوع، حتى نحن هلا الصحفيين البيئيين واللي عم بيحاولوا إنهم يغطوا هذا الموضوع البيانات ما لها متوفرة ابدا بنلاقي بيانات كثير كثير عامه ما بنعرف مين الاشخاص اللي عن جد عم ينزحوا لاسباب بيئيه والاشخاص اللي عم ينزحوا لاسباب ثانيه ما عم نقدر نعرف عن جد شو هي المتطلبات فهي اكيد واحده من الصعوبات اللي بتواجهنا 
وحده كمان من القضايا اللي بلاقي انه كثير مهم يتسلط الضوء عليها هي موضوع التمويل، يعني التمويل لما هو عم بيتوجه للبلدان المتاثره بالتغيرات المناخيه او بالنزاعات او بالاثنين مع بعض، طب هذا التمويل لمين بده يروح؟ وكيف حيتم صرفه؟ هل هو حيعطى على شكل منح او قروض؟ مين الاشخاص المسؤولين عن صرفه بهي البلدان اللي حياخذوها؟ ومين الاشخاص المسؤولين عن الرقابه؟ فاكيد الصحافه لها كثير دور بانها هي تضوي على كل هي النقاط. في كمان موضوع كثير مهم ملاقيه يمكن اكثر بالصحافه الغربيه اللي هو موضوع يعني بنسمع بنقرا مثلا تقارير ارتفاع مستوى المياه مثلا رح يهدد المدن الساحليه وكانه المياه مستوى المياه رح يرتفع لحاله بدون ما يكون في دول وصناعات وكثير اسباب هي عم تسبب هذا الموضوع للاسف عم يعني عم نسمع عن الاثر بس ما كثير عم نقرا عن المسبب فكثير مهم كمان نحن كصحفيين دائما نكون منتبهين انه لما عم نحكي عن شغله نرجع نوجه نعرف تماما لوين نوجه اللوم آه مثل ما نحكي هلا اللوم هو لا يوجه لهي البلدان الضعيفه اللي هي الاكثر تاثرا بالتغيرات المناخيه واللي هي يمكن عم تساهم ب 0.5 من من كل هي الاسباب فكثير مهم نحن خاصه كصحفيين بالمنطقه انه نحن نرجع دائما نعرف ليش هي التغيرات المناخيه عم بتصير ومين سببها وبالتالي كمان مين هو المسؤول عن انه هو يساعد البلدان المتضرره انا حكى كثير بمؤتمر المناخ الماضي عن صندوق خسائر الاضرار كان في كثير نقاشات عن مين بده يمول هذا الصندوق مين بده يستفيد منه فاكيد كمان للاسف بالاعلام العربي يعني لسه هي المواضيع ما كثير عم عم تتناول بشكل كمان يكون مفهوم سواء للناس سواء لصناع القرار فأكيد كمان هي واحدة من من مهماتنا ك كصحفيين أه بعتقد هدول النقاط هلا بدي أحكي عنها شكرا زينة Um, so we'll have another round, of course, and here we will delve more in depth around accountability. It was mentioned mentioned in the beginning. Even you mentioned loss and damage. So who will be responsible for these uh, for the displaced community? Who will have to pay the prices? And here I'd like to go to back to you, Mac, uh, to give specific examples in Iraq um, around accountability measures and what are the local initiatives and local civil society organizations that are pushing for accountability specifically for those who have been displaced due to environmental catastrophes. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Sure. Okay. There you go. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the question of accountability can be kind of broken into different areas or domains. Within the Iraqi governmental system, within almost any um, Middle East government, there are certain government agencies that are technically supposed to serve the function of monitoring and evaluation, environmental uh, degradation, toxicity, and what have you. In Iraq, and I'm sure it's the case across the region, but I, I don't have the data for that. Uh, in Iraq, these ministries, um, since 2003, um, both by the Americans and then subsequently by the post-2003 Iraqi government, have been, you know, systemically underfunded uh, and politically marginal. And so the Ministry of Environment, which technically has the authority uh, to issue uh, violations for industrial waste and pollu pollution, um, you know, they not only don't have the instruments and the funding to develop that, that kind of capacity, they also don't have the political weight or the authority to go to the Ministry of Oil and say, give us your freshwater data usage, right? Uh, give us your, uh, your, your, your emissions data. They can't do it. They'll be blocked. Um, both because of the, of course, the political weight of the Ministry of Oil, uh, also just a kind of interagency uh, you know, a bureaucratic regime in Iraq that's that's very convoluted. But this this brings me to, so when we think about, um, you know, why is it that accountability within the Iraqi governmental system itself is so weak? I think we have to also raise some questions about what the international community funds and doesn't fund. Um, you know, it was brought up earlier that oftentimes there's too much focus on the technical and not enough on the political. 
I would put it somewhat differently, that the, the, the technical itself is political. You know, so what, what counts as, as, as an important technical space of intervention uh, and what doesn't uh, is, is guided by certain incentives. So just to give one example, uh, you'll find a lot of funding in Iraq right now from different UN agencies, uh, US aid, as well as their, their contractors for sustainable farming. Right, and so you have all these programs that basically give farmers, um, you know, sprinklers and the like, uh, so that they're not using uh, "quote unquote" outdated flood irrigation methods. You know, um, and by the way, these flood irrigation methods are still used in my home state of Texas, and no one says they're outdated. But you know, in Iraq, these are Sumerian methods; they're outdated, uh, they're antiquated. We need to move to these um, highly, you know, sustainable farming methods. Um, and this kind of technical space is one that the that the international community has plenty of experts to provide for. Lots of, you know, agricultural experts that, that can kind of intervene on these spaces. Um, and it's simple. All you have to do is kind of a couple million dollars. You can buy some of these sprinkler kits, uh, pass them out, train the farmers. Everyone's happy. You can have a few photos. Um, and you know, never mind the fact that probably most of these farmers, the 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 margins are too tight to where they're they're going to have to sell this equipment at the end of the season. Uh, probably there's not vendors locally that can even give them replacement parts for these things, and so they'll just you know it just doesn't work in the the local agricultural economy. But it looks like a a, a technically sound space. Now, why isn't why aren't there experts, international experts, international funding? Um, to do something different that actually the, the international community has lots of expertise in, which is environmental monitoring. Uh, so the, Envi the, the Ministry of, of Environment, the Ministry of Health in Iraq, um, historically underfunded, politically weak, plenty of European institutions, American institutions have the capacity uh, to put money, resources, time, effort into these kinds of institutions and actually to give them a little bit of uh, political weight or backing, because if they got this sort of international attention, but that doesn't happen. Uh, and if it does happen, it happens at a very, very minute scale. <clears throat> and so what I'm trying to get at here is that there are, um, the, the accountability space in Iraq is a space that really has been neglected by international actors. The only actors that really have kept it alive, uh, as Serene was sort of indicating, are uh, local environmental groups. There are environmental platforms in Iraq that track violations. They don't have a lot of uh, backing or support. Uh, there are individual activists who risk their lives to share environmental data, uh, emissions data. Uh, and sometimes though, even uh, these, these scholars get uh, assailed by other scholars in Iraq. Uh, they'll say your methods. Uh, unfortunately, Dr. Shukri Hassan isn't here with us today. One of the, the bravest you know, environmental activists in Iraq uh, goes around collecting air emissions data, produced a documentary with Azhar, our other, our other uh, colleague here. Uh, this kind of work is really dangerous to do, uh, uh, but it's, it's really the only kind of environmental monitoring mechanism that you could say is, is both somewhat effective and public at the same time. What we're trying to do, what certain groups are trying to do in Iraq, um, is build new networks uh, for uh, data collection and data monitoring uh, that can do this kind of work through kind of citizen science mechanisms. But the, 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 the nexus between science as a form of accountability and governance in Iraq has been you know, politically marginalized, historically underfunded, so it's, it's an uphill battle. Don't be shy. You know. <laughs> um, I'd like to move to you, Musaid, and to continue on what Mac has been saying. What are the also comparisons uh, of local initiatives in the context of uh, Yemen, specifically local civil society actors vis-a-vis -vis pushing for accountability measures? Uh, well, in terms of uh, emergency actions in Yemen, we, we are rich with emergency actions. And... Um, and um, it's important, and I would say, uh, just like Nadim said in the beginning, it's needed for immediate relief 
and sometimes it's the option or sometimes it is it's a matter of life this emergency actions as it is the case today in Gaza for example with the people in need of the basic things like food and water but in some cases it, it is not the right option especially in uh, countries where the war and conflict takes long many years eight years uh, because finally it led to the uh, uh, dependency on aid, uh, but also uh, political interventions uh, to um, to uh, yeah divert the resources and uh, interfere in these uh, resources, but also unbalance in these emergency actions. If in the reports are very well prepared, but in reality it is not the case. Um, uh, the priorities also is not always there. Uh, I mean, what the people can do with the sanitation systems if they don't have clean water. What the people can do uh, to learn how to clean their hands since they don't have uh, the food to eat and the shelters. So the priorities is, is a very uh, big issue in Yemen. So uh, support uh, of uh, uh, displacement uh, with life saving uh, basics like food and water and shelters is needed, but it is not, uh, but not the optional standards developed in the stable uh, environment. So emergency, uh, it should be short. It, it's needed in conflict areas, in emergency actions, but it should be short and uh, should lead to a transition to deployment actions. Uh, because the long term of emergency actions affecting the future sustainability of the systems uh, in, in, in countries, uh, not only the uh, sustainability of infrastructures, but also, also the sustainability of institutions, the capacities of the institutions. Many, many experts uh, leave uh, the uh, institutions and start to work with the international organizations. And this is, I mean, if they were stopped today, what, what the local institutions will do tomorrow. Uh, so it's, it's a problematic. Uh, also the, uh, uh, for the basic services of, 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 of like uh, water and electricity, the uh, organization replaced replace this uh, infrastructures by immediate and emergency interventions and leave this infrastructure without working and leaving them without working means they are outdated. Also, uh, many, many uh, organizations work with their own strategies uh, or with, with the sponsors strategies and leaving behind the local and the national strategies, even they have good strategies. And this, was, this also uh, is, is uh, uh, putting a negative impact of the future sustainability. Um, there, is, there is a call and there is initiatives from locals, but also from uh, official institutions to move from emergency actions to deployment actions. But there is a big resistance, to be honest, from the uh, uh, agencies working in emergency actions, especially from international and UN agencies. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's un understandable. Emergency actions is easy actions, easy process to study, to implement, which is not the case when come to the uh, development interventions, which is uh, required, uh, which needs time and efforts to, to, to be implemented. But it is the right things to do uh, in, in, in such countries which have uh, experienced long-term conflict and, and war. So uh, what, what we are doing, uh, we, I mean, as a think tank uh, and locals, we are trying to push in the side we organize uh, seminars. I mean, in, in all, almost in all of our events, we are trying to put this uh, issue in our activities and how to move for emergen from emergency to, to development and how to encourage the uh, international communities to, to support the locals to, uh, to, to start to stand on their feet, uh, preparing for the period after the conflict but still difficult. There is also an uh, initiative supported by the uh, local authorities and some international embassies in Yemen, like uh, Dutch and German embassies, uh, to support the uh, approach of, uh, if I say it correctly, uh, 
base human terrain and development process. But it is stuck somewhere, it, it does not move. So there is uh, really difficulties to move from emergency to development. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a problem because uh, also the official governments are weak. So they cannot push this uh, forward. And without a strong intervention, interventions from the uh, organizations and researchers and uh, international uh, partners, it will keep, uh, I think, for a long time. So let's try our best to, to move this forward. Thank you. شكرا رح نرجع عن زينا رح نرجع لعندك ورح نقلب شوي للعربي حكيتي قبل شوي عن ال عن المجتمع المحلي ودور الاعلاميين والاعلام كشكل عام اذا نطلع بالكونتكست تبع سوريا كيف فيكم تحاسبوا حاليا اين هي المحاسبه وكيف فيكم توصلوا اصوات المحليين بهالمحاسبه يعني كمان انتم تضوا الضوء ك... كاعلاميين مستقلين. سؤال صعب. أه هلا اول شيء اكيد مهم نفهم اللي عم بصير نفهم السياق قبل ما نفوت بموضوع المحاسبه. أه بسوريا كثير بينحكى مثلا عن موجات الجفاف اللي صارت قبل 2011 وانه هي كانت احد المحركات للانتفاضه اللي صارت ب 2011 وما بعد. أكيد هي ممكن تكون أحد الأسباب لكن كثير مهم نفهم يعني كثير كمان عم بيروج لتغير المناخ حاليا والكوارث البيئية إنه هي واحدة من أكبر المشاكل ممكن اللي عم نعاني منها حاليا اللي بتسبب بعض ال... بعض حالات النزوح أو بعض ال... بعض المشاكل لكن المشكلة هي ما فقط تغير مناخي أكيد عندنا المشاكل الأكثر هي سوء الإدارة على مدى عقود متواصلة عندنا مشاكل إلى علاقة بالفساد ف وهذا الشيء مو بس بسوريا يعني كمان بنلاقي مثلا بالعراق بنروح على العراق بنلاقي بنحكي مثلا عن اثر التغيرات المناخيه على الاهوار لكن واحدة من مشاكل الاهوار انه تم تجفيفها لعقود كمان لاسباب سياسيه ولاسباب اقتصاديه ونفس الشيء بمصر مثلا ما انا اهم كارثه يمكن هلا عم تعاني منها مصر هي التغير المناخي وانما كمان سياسات خاطئه بالزراعه تم اعتماد سياسات على مدى عقود لزياده الانتاج الزراعي ببعض المحاصيل اللي هي ما كانت مناسبه واللي استنزفت المياه الجوفيه هذا الشيء بنلاقيه بكثير بلدان وبالتالي مهم اول شيء ان احنا نفهم الاسباب اللي وصلتنا يمكن للواقع اليوم اللي عم نحكي فيه انه بلداننا العربيه هي من اكثر بلدان تاثرا بالتغيرات المناخيه واكثر بلدان اللي واقعها البيئي حاليا سيء هي اكيد متاثره بالتغيرات المناخيه لكن هي متاثره بظروف ثانيه كثير معقده وكثير صعب احيانا نفصلها كثير صعب نفهم انه يمكن هذا الشخص هو نزح بسبب الصراع يمكن رجع نزح رجع على بيته ام لا في جفاف ام رجع نزح مره ثانيه فالحالات كثيره والحالات معقده فهي اول مرحله بعتقد اذا نحن كصحفيين او حتى كمراكز ابحاث نفهم تماما شو عم بيصير نحاول نحصل على بيانات كمان حكينا يمكن انه الحصول على بيانات خاصه البيانات الرسميه هو موضوع كثير صعب فقديش نحن كمان قادرين انه نحن نقدر نجمع بيانات نحن نقابل الناس ما نعتمد فقط يمكن على صور مسبقة عنا نحن كتير مهم إنه نحن نكون عن جد على الأرض ونقدر نقابل الأشخاص وبعدين نعرف تماما شو شو المطلوب هل المطلوب إنه نحن نساعد الناس يبقوا بمكانهم هل المطلوب نرجع نأهل بنية تحتية معينة أو هل المطلوب هدول الأشخاص يرجعوا يروحوا على مكان تاني يقدروا يبنوا حياة جديدة يمكن كمان نساعد حكى باليمن الناس عم بيكون عندها عدة خيارات أما تضل بمكانها أما تروح مكان جديد فبنرجع بنقول دائما هي الاستماع لاصوات الناس نعرف عن جد الناس شو احتياجاتها وشو عم بيصير معها يمكن بعدين نروح لموضوع المحاسبه هو سؤال كمان مين بدنا نحاسب يعني كمان مو سهل دائما نعرف سواء عم نحكي بمنطقتنا نحاسب الحكومات وهل احنا قادرين عن جد نحاسبها مثل ما قال اذهار يعني نعمل وثائقي كثير هائل عن موضوع النفط بس بالنهايه شو بده يصير بعده لمين نحن قادرين نتوجه هل قادرين نتوجه لحكوماتنا اللي هي تعاني من عقود من خلينا نقول الترهل والفساد والمؤسسات اللي ما عاد قادره اصلا انه هي تعمل شيء، وزارات البيئه هي عندنا وين؟ هي ما عم تعمل شيء، تمويلها كثير ضعيف كمان مثل ما قال ماك، هي ضعيفه جدا سياسيا، ما لها اي حضور على ارض الواقع، او بدنا نحاسب كل الحكومات او بدنا نروح كمان نحكي مع المنظمات، منظمات المنظمات المحلية ومنظمات المجتمع المدني، كمان يمكن المنظمات المحلية البيئية بمنطقتنا خلينا نقول لا حول لها ولا قوة، ما كثير قادرة إنه هي تعمل شيء سواء لأنه تمويلها كثير ضعيف، سواء لأنه هي ما لها قادرة تتحرك على الأرض أو حتى لما هي بتحاول تعمل أي تحرك له علاقة بواقع بيئي معين، هي عم تصطدم بعقبات، عم تصطدم بتهديدات، يمكن بالعراق مثلا 
الناس بتحاول انه هي تعمل اي تحرك بيئي رح يجي تهديد سواء من الحكومه او سواء من الشركات الاجنبيه اللي هي مستفيده من من مثلا خلينا نقول الواقع النفطي اللي هلا موجود بالعراق فاكيد المنظمات المحليه اللي عم تحاول تشتغل موضوع البيئه للاسف حضورها بشوف بكل المنطقه عنا هو كثير ضعيف اذا بدي احكي على سوريا قلة قليلة جدا من المنظمات البيئية هلا بتحاول تشتغل او قادرة انه هي تشتغل، المشاريع اللي هي بتشتغلها كثير مشاريع عادية جدا تشجير تنظيف قليل ما نسمع عن منظمة عن جد قادرة تفصد الانتهاكات وتشتغل على انه هي توجه اللوم لجهة معينة، فكمان نحن قديش قادرين نقوي هي المنظمات، نقوي هدول الاشخاص لانه هن كمان بالنهاية عم بيتركوا هي المنظمات عم بيروحوا لاشغال ثانية يمكن او عم بيروحوا ل لمنظمات دولية وبالتالي العمل عن جد المحلي اللي على الأرض عم بيكون كتير ضعيف في أكيد طبعا بعض الأمثلة الناجحة ما رح أقول إنه الصورة كتير قاتمة في أمثلة ناجحة في منظمات عم تقدر تشتغل في حتى شركات قطاع خاص هلأ بسوريا في بعض الشركات اللي هي عم بتحاول تعمل دراسات بيئية مثلا تستنبط أنواع جديدة من من مزروعات أو من قمح وتحاول إنه هي تتواصل مع الحكومة تتواصل مع وزارة الزراعة وتقول إنه هذا النوع مثلا من القمح بيستهلك مي أقل فتعالوا نجربه بمناطق معينة هذا الشيء موجود لكن هو كتير عن نطاق صغير وكتير بحاجة إنه هو يتوسع واكيد كمان هو دورنا هون كصحافه ان احنا نضوي على على هي التجارب واذا بدنا نروح لمستوى اعلى هي المنظمات الدوليه او المجتمع الدولي اذا نحن عن جد قادرين نوصل له ونحاسبه عم يعني عم نحاول انه يكون اكيد في اصوات سواء بالمشاركه بالمؤتمرات الدوليه بوجود التفاوض اللي هي كمان لساتها للاسف كثير ضعيفه لكن اكيد دائما مهم انه نرجع يعني نركز على موضوع قديش هي بلداننا متاثره بالتغيرات المناخيه وقديش هي عم تدفع الثمن وقديش هي بحاجه لتمويل بس للاسف هذا التمويل اما ما عم بيوصلها اما عم يوصلها بشكل خاطئ اما ما عم تقدر تحصل عليه او قديش هو بالنهايه كيف عم بتنفذ شو الرقابه اللي عم بتصير عن جد على هذا التمويل فهي كمان مهماتنا كلنا كصحفيين او كمراكز ابحاث انه نتوجه نحن لكل هي المستويات انه نحاول نوصل الاصوات بس الاصوات الحقيقيه مو الاصوات اللي نحن بنفترض انه انه هي هيك قصص لا عن جد بدنا نسمع الحكايات من الناس ونوصلها واذا قادرين نحاسب بيكون منيح ما بعرف عن جد اذا رح نقدر نوصل لمحاسبه شكرا شكرا عبد الفتاح كمان نرجع لعندك على موضوع المحاسبة بس كمان من المؤسسات المعنية المحلية إذا فيك تعطي أمثلة عن السودان كمان هنرجع بعدين عن جورجي ولح ناخد أسئلة من الجمهور في ست أسئلة أونلاين فضل أوكي طيب آه السؤال ممكن يقودني إلى 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 تفاصيل أكثر إنه يعني أتكلم عن الجانب جانب آه يعني المنظمات الدولية والجانب المنظمات المحلية في في السودان. السودان كبلد متنوع فيه تقريبا ما يقارب ال 100 او اكثر من 100 لهجة متحدثة واكثر من 500 تقريبا قبيلة. هذا التنوع بلا شك يعكس تنوع النسيج السوداني وقناعه الا انه في اللحظة في الجانب الاخر يشكل تحدي و تعقيدات في ظل التغير المناخي وال والانكماش الاقتصادي العالمي وتاثيره على السودان فهذا الجانب بلا شك سينعكس مباشره على 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 النازحين في المعسكرات وعلى الاسايلم سيكرز والرفيجيز الجايين من من مختلف البلدان للسودان طيب هذا الشيء المنظمات والاكترز عموما في السودان لم يستثمروا فيه بالقدر المطلوب بمعنى انه المنظمات عموما كانت تركز على مجال المساعدة الانسانيه والاميريت نيدز واهملت تماما الجانب المساعدات الانمائيه حتى المساعدات الانمائيه في تركيزها كانت تركز على على كيسات ليس فيها برنامج سوشيال سوشيال كوهيشن يعني انه تدعم تدعم برامج التماسك المجتمعي وتدعم برامج انه المجتمعات تتحاور مع بعض زي ما ذكر دكتور نديم انه يكون في ديسكورس لانجويج لغه الحوار تكون حاضره لغه السلام تكون حاضره في في المشاريع ده اللي ممكن يخلي المجتمعات 
تنسى تماما الخلافات تتناسى الخلافات تقدر تعيش في سلام وتمشي إلى بر الأمان وبالتالي القالبية المساعدات اللي كانت تركز كانت تركز بصورة رئيسية من جانب الأكترس على جانب المساعدات الاحتياجات اليومية واللايبليهود وقيرة من المساعدات لكن مؤخرا أعتقد في في السودان أصبحت المنظمات تنتبه إلى هذا الشيء وهنا يستحضرني مثال لبرنامج اليونيسيف وبرنامج الغذاء العالمي WFP لديهم مبادرة في 2020 أعتقد كانت تستهدف السكان النازحين في ولايات دارفور كان في برنامج مدعوم من الحكومة الألمانية مدة أربع سنوات أعتقد بدأ 2022 الآن ما ما أدري حصل فيه شنو لكن كان يركز بصورة رئيسية على إنه يكون في سوشيال كوهيشن يكون في دعم للمبادرات الثقافية المبادرات الاقتصادية اللي بتخلي المجتمعات الموجودة في معسكرات النزوح تتواصل مع بعض وتكون في وان اكتيفيتي او وان بيزنس مع بعض فهذا الشيء كثير كان ممكن يكون مفيد لو كان سابقا موجود في في برامج المساعدات الانمائيه بالنسبه للمنظمات وبالنسبه للاكترز اللوكال والانترناشونال اعتقد انه الاله هذا الجانب كان يعني ممكن ان يحسم كثير جدا من القضايا اللي حصلت في في بلداننا. ليه؟ لانه لانه الجانب التماسك المجتمعي وجانب خلق صلات وروابط ما بين المجتمعات المختلفه بلا شك يمكن ان يعزز قوه هذه المجتمعات اذا اذا تم استثماره بصوره بصوره مفيده. وبالتالي هنا اجد انه المنظمات واللوكال اكترز والانترناشونال اكترز لابد كما ذكر اخي اخي مساعد انه لابد من من تفعيل جانب التماسك المجتمعي عن طريق البيلدينج كاباسيتي بناء القدرات المؤسسيه لللوكال لللوكال اكترز او اللوكال بارتنرز وإضافة إلى ذلك تمكين المارجنالايز جروب زي الومن زي اليوس وده بلا شك بيأتي عن طريق إنه يعني هؤلاء الشباب وهؤلاء المارجنالايز جروب إنهم يتواصلوا إنهم يكونوا ممكنين في الـ الـ في عندهم وجود في الأكتيفيتيز لايفليهود أكتيفيتيز بلا شك سيخلق جانب من التماسك المجتمعي طبعا إضافة إلى دعم مبادرات مثلا تتيح البروسيس البروموتنج بالنسبه للبيس بيلدينج وغيره من جانب اللوكال اورجنايزيشن واللوكال ان جي اوز اضافه الى ذلك اجد انه منظومه التعليم ومنظومه التريننج اللي متاحه بالنسبه للمدارس لابد ان يتم مراعاه هذا الجانب ويتم ايلاءه اهميه ولذلك استثمار في هذه هذه الاربع محاور او اربع نقاط يمكن ان يخلق رابط مجتمعي وممكن ان يقينا صراعات في المستقبل. جورجي ام كوينج باك تو يو ان ذا كونتكست اوف فلسطين توداي. ان سبيسيفيكلي اف وي لوك ات فلسطينيين ريفيجيز ان and uh, about double displaced refugees, how can humanitarian organizations and these interventions become more sustainable? And how can there be more synergy between the refugees and the host communities? And specifically, if you can give examples from Palestine, and then we'll move to questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, Absolutely. I think one of the big challenges is how do we make that shift from short-term humanitarian action, relief action, um, and, and shift the emphasis far more towards uh, lasting interventions that do benefit both displaced communities and, and host communities. Um, pending, uh, the term we use at UNRWA is a just and lasting solution to their plight, and that could be applied equally to refugee communities, refugee populations. Uh, anywhere, whether that's the ability to go home to a safe space, whether that's the ability to uh, to relocate somewhere else, um, relocation beyond. I just want to say, relocation is well beyond the mandate of of UNRWA. Our um, our 
mandate involves supporting Palestine refugees and until there is a lasting solution. Um, within the humanitarian sector, we have often focused on uh, the impacts of humanitarian response. Um, I, so looking at uh, issues such as the unsustainable abstraction of water, how we provide water to displaced communities, how do we um, how do we provide food? Is it the right food? Does it is um, is cooking it going to cause widespread deforestation? Understanding these challenges is important. I remember uh, being involved in in supporting the assessment of. Uh, the influx of people into Cox's Bazaar. So this is an example from outside the region, but um, within six months, they deforested an area that had taken 20 years and $15 million to rehabilitate. Um, so those issues are important, um, but they are not the things that will provide lasting solutions to to people on the ground, um, to to host communities and, and the displaced communities. Um, there's been a lot of work to, to document that. There are some really interesting um, initiatives looking at how do we improve uh, the generation of waste in places where there's no infrastructure and, and possibly not uh, an effective regulatory or, or governance mechanism for managing um, waste, the greenhouse gas emissions of, um, of humanitarian uh, of humanitarian interventions. And I think we will be talking after lunch about the um, the very important work that's been done to quantify the additional greenhouse gas impacts of warfare in, in Gaza in particular. Um, so there is this need to shift away from, from short-termism in terms of the way we, we deliver support to people and a need to look at um, the fact that we have often treated displacement as temporary and increasingly the evidence tells us that at the very least we're talking about a medium-term situation. Most refugees in Kenya have been, or the camps in Kenya have existed for around 30 years. Uh, we spoke before about the fact that in uh, that many Palestine refugees have been displaced since 1948 um, and, and in some ways since um, uh, a number of the... the Internal conflict in Syria now began more than a dozen years ago. So there are many examples from across our region. Um, and, and often we've said, well, we can't build something permanent as a solution because it might stop people from going home. But I think the evidence increasingly tells us that that's not what stops people from going home. The situation on, on the ground at home is what stops people from, from going home, from re, re, repatriating or relocating. And... If we stop thinking about interventions as somehow unfairly benefiting refugees um, and we can focus on undisplaced people and we can focus on putting in place lasting structures that, um, that can support uh, both refugee communities and host communities. And then if those refugee communities move on, these host communities, which we've, uh, which we've already emphasised, are overwhelmingly people in developed countries who did also not cause the environmental challenges in many cases that they are now facing. Um, then so what if we've built something lasting that host communities can continue to benefit from? Um, so I think the other element that, that we're speaking about increasingly is, is how do we then engage people as, as agents, not only in terms of, uh, I really value the, the contributions of, of other panellists around um, the risks taken by local environmental activists and academics and, and institutions um, to, to document and, um, uh, and to, to seek justice and try and avail of the international justice mechanisms that, that should exist and, and that, are, um, that are weak in many countries, uh, including in your know, environmental justice is, is, is a challenge everywhere. Um, but then how do we, how do we look at um, solutions that will tackle several problems at once, but that will also engage both host communities and displaced communities as, um, as agents of, of change and not just as beneficiaries, but as contributors to a more just and uh, sustainable society for all. And perhaps that is one of the necessary preconditions for getting away from uh, some of the uh, some of the 
uh, challenges that I think Mac described in terms of you know, we can put in place drip irrigation, we can put in place hydroponics, um, we can put in place waste separation programs. But unless those initiatives are, are connected to something bigger, um, in terms of whether that's uh, a government strategy, and we see some tremendous uh, efforts by the government of Jordan, for example, towards uh, sustainable uh, global, uh, green growth um, initiatives in a number of, of key sectors. It's something that we at UNRWA are really keen to explore in terms of how we can leverage an existing, small but existing uh, capacity in providing vocational education and training beyond, um, beyond schools, how we can leverage citizen science in schools um, to start equipping people who are displaced with the skills that will be needed, not just here in Jordan, but everywhere. How do we support livelihoods planning? How do we uh, leverage our, again, small but existing micro, um, micro business, um, micro finance capacities to deliver solutions that are more joined up, that are more integrated, that, um, that look at how um, uh, micro businesses set up by refugees can, um, uh, can contribute to uh, a much needed growth in private sector um, or in uh, supporting not not for profit um, uh, undertakings and and looking at how do we how do we build something that's not only more environmentally sustainable but but delivers those social sustainability dividends as well. Thank you. We'll open up uh, to questions from the audience. Yes, Sami, and then Sada. You can use the mic. Yeah, you can hear me? Okay. Uh, thanks so much for all the great insights. I have uh, two questions for Mac. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, you were bringing up technical is political. I couldn't agree more. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we know all too well what the Gulf War and the Iraqi War did to agricultural infrastructure and, and sanctions that then, of course, also uh, damaged the agricultural sector they, you know, there were uh, bombing campaigns done on, on water infrastructures, right? And so um, I, I think USAID, like you said, and I'm sure many other uh, US affiliated, uh, you know, foreign aid organizations are focused on sustainable agriculture. So I'm wondering why, I think you were starting to allude to it, but you didn't uh, get there. So I'm wondering why sustainable agriculture, is it uh, out of remorse? I doubt it. But um okay and then my other question is um related to uh the citizen science that i, I was talking with the with Wim yesterday a little bit about this so the citizen science that i think you're now going to be venturing into more um so uh, i mean depending on where you're working but if you're working in these communities of extra extraction and you know uh, frontline communities uh, most probably you're going to uncover, you know, devastation, environmental health devastation, et cetera. And so um, I'm just wondering, what do you imagine doing with that data? Um, of course, these are very dangerous, uh, dangerously powerful forces uh, behind these uh, devastations. So, um, you know, is the citizen science action oriented? Is it, uh, uh, is it that the same people that helped you gather the, that data are to take action with that data? And if so, um, how do you uh, combat feelings of uh, defeat and helplessness against forces that might target you, target your family, or you know, really make your life a living hell if you're, if you're uh, coming up against them? So just just wondering on those hard questions. Yeah. So, so I'll ask, I'll answer these quickly and then uh, we can follow up more afterwards, but quick answers. So why sustainable agriculture? One of it's a question of responsibility. So <clears throat> sustainable ag agriculture emphasizes the responsibility of the farmer as the, as the problem effectively, right? Because the farmer is using too much water. So it sidesteps um, questions around, you know, governmental actors that are responsible for water infrastructure, because, of course, um, you know, oftentimes the irrigation networks, the, the canal systems, the pumping stations, the actual big infrastructures that get water to places are deteriorated, haven't been maintained. 
Um, it's much easier for the UN or not just the UN, USAID, any number of other international actors to come in and say, let's not get into this complicated stuff with the Ministry of Water Resources, with their pumping stations that don't work, with their irrigation canals, which are also really expensive and maybe we'll have to pay for infrastructure and we don't like paying for infrastructure because of all the contractual issues. Let's just deal with this, you know, the farmer's the problem. Uh, give him some um, sprinklers, he'll use less water. And so it, it, it's... I don't want to, I don't mean to say it's completely cynical, but I think there's a lot of sort of sidestepping the complex politics of dealing with more complicated interventions uh, and the money that goes with it. Um, you know, the, the second question, I think it really has to be thought through carefully and, and contextually. Um, you know, each region within Iraq, and I would probably say this is across, across the board in, in the broader Middle East region, you know, th there are activist networks and data streams that can be activated in certain localities and, and, and not others. If you take, just to give a couple quick examples, um, you know, Basra of five years ago, six years ago, if we were trying to do a citizen science, you know, effort there, the state society relation at that time was so fraught, mass protests, burning down, you know, embassy, it would have been, you know, horrifically stupid to, to try to get something off the ground, right? Now, um, you know, the, the current governor is, is really trying to kind of uh, play nice with, with the local population for, for different reasons. And there's a bit of an opening for activists to do a little bit more, even though it's still very, very complicated. I'm not saying it's easy, right? Certain other provinces, you, you, you can't do this work at all. So, so like in Maison, um, uh, Azhar could probably speak to it. Try and do a citizen science uh, project in that place and it will get shut down by the local political authorities pretty quickly. So it, it you know, it, it really depends on the place and, and you have to, I, I think you can't make these judgments in the abstract. It changes a lot. Now we have a little bit of an opening in certain provinces, but it might close. Um. سعد علاو أنا رئيس قسم الصحافة بالمفكرة القانونية وباحثة بقضايا البيئة وحقوق الإنسان عندي عندي للحقيقة سوري عندي للحقيقة نقطتين واحدة منهم العلاقة ب وهي جزء من اللي بدنا نحكيه بجلسة بكرة بس تسارع القضايا البيئية والتدهور البيئي بالعالم هو أكبر بكتير من ال من شغل عم ينشغل على الأرض وخصوصا بإعداد صحفيين يقدروا يكونوا عم بيواجهوا هذه التحديات بمجتمعات وخصوصي بمنطقتنا متلهية بفعل أداء السلطات وفسادها بلقمة العيش والبيئة مشكلة مؤجلة للاهتمام يعني بدل المجتمعات المتأزية من القضايا البيئية السيئة ببلادنا مأجلة معركتها لأن منا كتير آنية بالنسبة لها هلأ حستها ربطة الخبز أسرع الأمان الشخصي أسرع وبالتالي هيدي الجهود كمان منيح تكون عم تتفعل أكتر مع الأخذ بعين الاعتبار أنه يكون عم بيصير في تمكين أكبر للصحفيين وليس فقط للشغل العادي والاعتيادي نحن صرنا بمحل بده دقة أكبر وتزويدهم بأدوات متطورة أكثر من الأول وكمان الحماية الحماية اللي بيحتاجوها بالمناطق الخطرة كمستهدفين وكمان بوجه السلطات وكذلك كيف يمكن أن نعمل كصحفيين على تحويل المجتمعات من ضحايا إلى مقاتلين معنا لأنه هاي القضايا بتحسن هيدا واحد يعني كمان في بالمحاسبة زيتا حتى المشاريع اللي بتنشغل سواء بلبنان واللي انحكى من العراق وسواء بالسودان وباليمن وسوريا وكلنا مثل بعض اللي بتجي من برا كأساس هني عم يعملوا لنا تنمي وبتنترك بالآخر مثل الرشاشات الماي اللي 
ترجع بعدين تنباع اللي هي ممكن الصحفيين يكونوا عم يلعبوا دور بمراقبه هذا المال وكيف يصرف وهل هو لزر الرماد انه نحن عم نعمل واجبنا تجاه هذه المناطق كدول تسببت بالتغير المناخي الاساسي لانه هي الدول الصناعيه الاساسيه وبالتالي عم تدفع ضريبه بس مش هممها هي الضريبه وين بتروح وانما نحن عم ندفع مصاري بس لندفع مصاري ونقول عملنا واجبنا وليس همنا انماء هذه المناطق فعليا والذهاب بهذه المشاريع الى أن تكون مستدامة أكثر وكمان وأنا بحكي هذا الشيء من لبنان الأموال التي تدفع للمنظمات المغيسة للاجئين وأنا بشتغل بالمخيمات تبع اللاجئين السوريين واللاجئين الفلسطينيين و ب 2016 بالكتاب اللي عملته عن الليطاني كان في بارت منه بس عن اللاجئين اللي عايشين على الليطاني اللاجئين السوريين اللي متروكين عايشين بقلب كل التلوث البيئي تبع الليطاني اللي هن متهمين انه جزء منه بينما الجمعيات اللي عم تصرف المال مش عم تتراقب مش عم بتكون وهيدا دور كمان صحافي كثير كبير بدي اختم بسؤال بعتذر اذا طولت للسيده ستيكلس عشان قصه الاونروا آه كمان بقصة الشغل أنا بشتغل كتير على مخيمات اللاجئين الفلسطينيين بلبنان وبعرف أنه الوضع البيئي بالمخيمات وبالتالي ربطهم في الصحي من الأسوأ بلبنان آه كيف تتوقع الأونار وتأثير الحملة الحالية عليها بوقف التمويل على شغلها بهيدا الجزء هلا كل شيء حيرتبط بالتقديمات كمان حيتأثر وهل هناك خطة استباقية أو بديلة رح تكون في حال أدت هذه الحملة بعد لمزيد من وقف التمويل لتكون ما عم تغرق المخيمات واللاجئين بمزيد من المشاكل شكرا تمام شكرا لك أحكي على أول نقطة حكيتي يا حضرتك العلاقة بالأولويات فعلا هي واحدة من الصعوبات اللي بنعانيها سواء كصحفيين أو حتى كناشطين بيئيين سواء بدك تكتبي عن موضوع بيئي او تنشطي بموضوع بيئي دائما يعني اول ردة فعل انه هي معنا اولويه اكيد خاصه ببلداننا الاولويه هي لجره الغاز عم بحكي على سوريا جره الغاز والبنزين والمازوت وتغيف الخبز وغيره بس كمان هون بيجي دورنا ل... ل... نقدر نحكي اكثر ننشط الوعي على فكره انه قديش هي التغيرات البيئيه التغيرات المناخيه والكوارث البيئيه اللي عم نعيشها هي حترجع تاثر علينا حتاثر على رغيف الخبز تبعنا وحتاثر على قدرتنا على الحياه اليوميه يمكن نبسط المفاهيم وحده كمان مشاكل الصحافه البيئيه انه هي يمكن صعبه معقده الناس بتنفر من انه هي تقرا مواضيع بيئيه كثير احيانا المواضيع البيئيه بتحسسنا بالخطر والتهديد وانه العالم حينتهي والكوارث البيئيه ح... ح... تبلعنا يمكن فما بنعود من ميل انه نقرا هي المواضيع، فكمان هاي احد ادوار الصحافه البيئيه هي تبسط المفاهيم وتقربها للناس وتربط الاشياء البيئيه بحياتنا اليوميه لحتى نحن نعرف انه عن جد نحن لازم نواجه هي الكوارث اضافه للاسف لكثير كوارث عم نواجهها بحياتنا اليوميه، لانه كمان هي الكوارث حتوصلنا انه نحن نفقد التنوع الحيوي، نحن نفقد مصادر الدخل تبعنا، نفقد مصادر الامن الغذائي تبعنا بيوم الايام آه الى جانب الكوارث الثانيه النزاع وغيره. أو بترك البعتقد بعد اللون. Uh, thanks very much. I'm happy to take the question, but of course I know everyone will appreciate that it's a, a tremendously dynamic and changing situation uh, that UNRWA faces and uh, that that this region is is grappling with. Um, I, what I would say is that UNRWA's mandate is given by the UN General Assembly and only the General Assembly can take it away. And I think all of us in our different organizations, whether we're UN, whether we're um, the most local of uh, of, of, of organizations um, or, or research units, we live in a gap, operate in a gap between our mandates or our missions and the funding available to deliver. Um, it's something that we have all become adept at managing in, in, in various ways. Um, there are, of course, contingency plans underway. Uh, there are a lot of discussions that are are taking place to, uh, first of all, emphasize the importance of continuing to support the unique situation of Palestine refugees, wherever they are, whether it's Lebanon, or whether it's uh, Palestine refugees from Syria who are now 
now in Lebanon, um, as well as obviously Syrians who have been displaced. And, and Lebanon is, as I mentioned earlier, one of those countries that has just taken wave after wave of people and, and, and where displaced people now make up a really significant percentage of the total population. Um, uh, so, of course, there's a lot of interest in how um, uh, in 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 what the way forward is. Um, I'm sorry, we don't have a really clear position on it, um, a really clear um, solution at the moment in the midst of a continually evolving situation. But if you wanted to touch base afterwards, we could speak briefly. Maybe just a couple of questions to the to the group. One is, uh, I mean, we know that cities are emerging as key players when it comes to uh, adaptation. Um, are humanitarian actors, are there examples from the region where humanitarian actors are trying to work with cities, uh, urban centers to um, deal with the challenges that displaced people uh, face given uh, you know, the environmental challenges? And just a second, uh, maybe a, a broader question, and maybe in concluding remarks, if people want to answer any aspect of it, I think three, four years ago, UNHCR organized one of their, you know, thinking uh, workshops sort of thing. And they talked at the time about similar, sim similar questions about how uh, UN agencies working with uh, refugees and displaced populations can integrate environmental sustainability concerns better in their work. And they had produced this sort of graph where they said, okay, we need better research to understand field practices, right? So actually practices of how local communities are themselves adapting, right? Because there's a local innovation aspect that happens, uh, uh, how people are uh, adapting their consumption modes, how people are adapting to heating, to food, to so forth, but also research and field practices by the uh, humanitarian actors. You know, I mean, one thing we didn't talk about here in, in Jordan, for example, in Zatari camp, UNHCR uh, built a big, uh, I think it was UNHCR that built it. Anyway, there's a big solar power plant outside the camp, right? That's supposed to provide electricity to the camp. You know, are these good practices, bad practices? All the sort of talk about like vertical uh, agriculture in displaced communities, you know, sort of research to better understand what's working. And here maybe just a, a footnote on accountability because humanitarian agencies tend to only think of their accountability towards the donors. So they're gonna spend tens of millions on assessments and reviews and, and, and evaluations, and it's a mini industry, but actually who reads these reports? Then it just tends to go to the donors, which often don't even read them and they go into a drawer. Um, and maybe one recommendation could be that humanitarian agencies should make part of these review assessments public so that the communities that they aim to serve actually get full aspect of who's benefiting from these broad projects, which ones worked, which ones did not. So it's just a second, you know. But also there was a, a second pillar that UNHCR identified, which what they called the sort of data gaps. You know, that there are real things that we don't know. So we don't know the air quality for uh, communities in Zatari, or maybe we do, I don't know actually about Zatari. We don't know about uh, calorie intake. We don't know about, uh, average temperature, how people survive uh, sandstorms in Iraq and Syria and so forth. So my question to you, sorry for this long-winded intro, is if I'm curious from your different positionalities, what are key gaps, research gaps that you would love to know? You know, if you say, I mean, this would make our intervention or our work that much more interesting if we could do this, because I'm wondering if we can start coming up with sort of research questions that us as a concerned communities can start uh, uh, thinking of and, and providing the answers. Sure. Um, I think I'll take um, the city's bit and then maybe some of the research bit. So um, by and large, international organizations, donors, uh, have not worked a whole lot uh, with uh, displaced communities in cities in Iraq. Uh, there's been some work at the kind of strategic level where they will work, you know, with the government of Iraq authorities uh, or the KRG authorities to kind of put together plans for, you know, flexible cities that can absorb populations and all this kind of stuff. It's it's really 
um, pretty vague, general, not implemented. Um, who's to say what will happen of it? But my my concern is that you know cities are, are are complex organisms and they have very complicated infrastructures. And to absorb new displaced people, you need things like an extending uh, water grid. You need you know water treatment facilities. You need uh, all sorts of infrastructure. And this stuff is expensive, and because it's expensive, it requires political negotiation. And international actors are, are just kind of staying out of all of that. Now, I don't want to say that they should get involved, because we know that when they do get involved, things can also be bad. Uh, but there's a, a way in which it, it, it ends up being a bit absurd. Uh, one conversation that I remember recently, uh, in Erbil, there was a meeting of some international donors with the government. And authorities from Erbil were basically saying, look, we, we're, we're having this displacement problem. Um, you know, people coming into the city, you know, we, we don't have uh, enough resources. We have parts of the city that no longer have water. No one raises the very obvious question in, in that whole meeting as to the fact that Erbil, the reason why these uh, problems exist really isn't because some displaced people showed up. It's because after 2003, with all these petrodollars, they expanded the, the city at a breakneck pace, didn't build a water grid, uh, and they don't want to build a water grid because they're addicted to development as the source of their economy. So, you know, it is these kinds of, 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 of political questions and governance questions are not something the international community wants to expend political capital on at all. Uh, and so they're going to remain kind of on the edges of these things. Cities are just too complicated. I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, اوكي طيب انا حاجاوب على السؤال الثاني اللاك اوف داتا واللاك اوف كوردينيشن والكوبريشن بين الان جي اوز اعتقد انه واحده من المشاكل الرئيسيه بالنسبه للهيومنيتيريان اجنسيز ان لحظه الانترفينشن مش في كالكوليشن واضح للبروجكت انه مش الامبلمنتيشن فقط ما بيتم بناء على زي ما ذكرت ريسيرش في عمليه بتاعت ايفالويشن قبليه وايفالويشن بعديه وذي تيك انفايرومنتال اندر كونسيدريشن وبالتالي لحظه الانترفينشن اللي بيتم بالنسبه للكامز وبالنسبه للارفيكي بليسمنت دائما بيكون في لاك في في لاك في في التنفيذ وبالتالي احنا حنرجع مره ثانيه للسايكل فيجن سايكل مش عارفين المشروع يتنفذ كيف ما حنقدر نطلع منه بيس براكتس ما حنقدر نعرف الخلل بالضبط كان شنو الا مجرد البور مانجمنت بالنسبه للريسورسز والويست وغيره من المشاكل والمشكله الاخيره هل هل الـ 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 هذا الشيء ناجم عن نقصان في في الخبره اعتقد تماما يعني مثلا عندنا في السودان غالبيه المنظمات اللي بتركز على الهيومنيتيريان ايد في خلل تماما في في الانفايرومنتال بوليسيز ما عندهم عندهم الكباسيتي اللي بتخليهم انهم تتاكل ذا انفايرومنتال ايشوز ليه بالنسبه لهم الاولويه الان الهيومنيتيريان انترفينشن وبالتالي حنرجع مره ثانيه انه اللاك اوف اكسبيرت هنا بيلعب دور في 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 عمل المنظمه اضافه الى ذلك الانفايرومنتال اورجانيزيشن الموجوده مش في كوردينيشن بينه وبين الهيومنيتيريان اجنسيز وبالتالي اللاك الموجود الان يمكن ان يرجع بصوره رئيسيه الى انه مش في كوردينيشن بيناتهم قد يرجع بصوره رئيسيه انه في كومبيتيشن للفاند في ليتس سو كول فاعتقد انه انه الحل اللي ممكن يكون عملي احنا محتاجين يكون في تفاهم ما بين الاكترز بيناتهم سواء كان انفايرومنتال اورجانيزيشن ولا هيومنيتيريان اورجانيزيشن لابد يكون في كوردينيشن كولابوريشن بيناتهم لانهم كلهم كملين لبعض اضافه الى مشكله الاخيره انه انه الداتا والبيس براكتس ذاتها بتطلع من 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 المنطقه مش في تشيير بالنسبه ما فيش ما في شيرنج بالنسبه لها يعني المنظمات عموما بتجيب بيس براكتس موجوده في دول ثانيه دول تماما بعيده تماما من من الواقع وتحاول تطبقها على على الواقع الموجود عندنا وهذا الخلل اللي حاصل عندنا 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think for regarding to the climate adaptation or climate issues in general and environmental issues, whether in cities or in rural areas, it is not in the right place, not only in the uh, uh, building process or decision makers, but also in the uh, international and local organizations working in this conflict areas. Uh, so uh, even, even in the last year, they start to consider these issues of climate and climate, but it's still far from the uh, what it deserves comparing to the impact of climate and environmental issues uh, in, in, in such uh, countries. And the data is a problem uh, in our countries. And to, to solve a part of this problem, because now most of the activities are, uh, are a top-down approach. And as, as my colleague said, sometimes it could be best from other countries, which should not be the case for this sort of country. And it is a problematic, and we have many, many negative examples of this. If the time allowed, maybe I can I can share share them later on. Uh, so one one of the best approach is to have a bottom up approach to start with the, for, from the communities itself, what they are doing, what is their experiences, what is their traditional knowledge uh, in terms of uh, services, in terms of uh, uh, water provision, in terms of climate adaptation, because. I mean, in, in such countries, it is dry countries since a long time ago, and the people adapted themselves to what they have. And they, 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 our countries are rich with, with such uh, climate adaptation uh, process, but they are uh, decreasing with time, especially with new technologies, with new interventions, with new projects, and this has affected, affected the traditional uh, practices to a large extent. Uh, sometimes even within the same country, it is not it is not the right things to uh, implement uh, the same project in different areas. Some areas has has different norms, different uh, traditional activities. So, starting from the communities itself uh, is is the best approach to address the uh, problems, whether related to the climate or related to the needs of the locals themselves. Uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> most, I, I think that the focus on cities is really important because most countries are experiencing rapid urbanisation, and I, even here in Jordan, what we see uh, is that many UNRWA camps, which in the you know after the events of, of forty eight or in in, uh, in the late sixties, uh, were established well outside the boundaries of um, of cities, uh, have been swallowed up by urban sp urban spread, and and so we now find that most. UNRWA camps are are in or at least on the verges of, of urban areas and it it does create different challenges people don't have access to land but they may have access to the capacity to start businesses um, there is obviously as uh, as has been said already a really clear need to make sure that that individual interventions are not only better coordinated amongst themselves not only that they have a better uh, evidence base both pre and post um, and and better connected to um, are better connected to both uh, sort of infrastructure but also government plans. We all need to do a better job of talking to each other. And I think that was one of the points that was made uh, right at the, at the start of, of today's session. We're wanting to try the purpose of, of groups like this is for us to get out of our silos, to move beyond who are the environmentalists and who are the social scientists. And, and discussions like this are really, really helpful, I think, for, um, for increasingly doing that. Uh, all of these point to this this need that I uh, alluded to alluded to earlier around needing to move beyond short termism and 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 stopping seeing displacement as essentially a temporary situation that will go away again and then everything will be fine. Things weren't fine before; they aren't fine now. And and even if a solution, uh, uh, even if a situation resolves and and people move on or move to another place. Uh, the host communities were probably not fine before and are probably not fine now. So seeing this as a human challenge, a 
a, a sustainable development challenge rather than than short term responding to a refugee situation is probably one of the biggest uh, shifts that I think needs to be made at many levels, and uh, it's certainly something that uh, that we look forward to uh, to being uh, to being a part of going forward. Okay, I think we've come to an end. Um, thank you very much to the five uh, panelists. So we can we can we can move a bit. <laughs> get some energy. Um, I think we've discussed many different topics and there are more questions out of this panel uh, around, around who's responsible, whose responsibility it is, uh, but also what are the accountability measures and do we really trust the UN system or the humanitarian organizations specifically in the context that we are uh, living now? And I think the next uh, panel after lunch will discuss uh, more specifically around Palestine and specifically around Gaza and who's responsible for this uh, conflict and um, so yeah looking forward to seeing you after lunch we have an hour and then we'll be back in this room an hour and a half oh, you want to give it off okay an hour and a half or an hour and 15 minutes and we'll be back here let's say an hour or so people will be here at 2 30. 2 40. 2 45. Let's give an hour and 15 minutes. Thank you so much.